And so, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. And those who have come so far on their journey to equality have a responsibility to reach back and help others join them. Because for all our differences, we are one people. You are listening to Context, where the past meets the present. Without further ado, let's get started. So we've had a lot of serious problems in uh, society lately that Robert and I have been discussing, and there's these huge problems that we need to tackle, and it's almost depressing sometimes, and it was hard to be positive last episode when Robert and I were talking about all the uh, the bombings and the, uh, the terrorist attacks and the shootings going on around the world, and it seems like 2016 is particularly historically more chaotic year than other recent years. So we're kind of going a different direction this episode by looking at how we kind of distract ourselves from the realities of society. So we're going to look at films first, and then we're going to probably delve a little bit more into other media like historical fiction. But the general question that I'm wanting to answer is, does Hollywood hurt more than it helps bring history to life? In other words, I think increasingly we're seeing more based on a true story films, or at least loosely based on a true story. And it seems like just consistently they get a lot of things wrong, and a lot of times it's intentional because they just want to tell a more entertaining story because that will sell more tickets or that will get more ad revenue or whatever. But oh, that's the overarching question, but we don't have to just stick to that question. There's a lot to unpack in that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I want to start though the discussion specifically Cypher's series based on a true story here's the latest which is about Spartacus that's one of my all time favorite movies and I was a little surprised to tackle that one actually because <laughs> I never thought of this much of, as a historical film Stanley Kubrick I've always been critical of how he portrays history I just love his films though because he's like pretty much my favorite director I mean you know you got Full Metal Jacket although you gotta admit his work with Barry Lyndon was oh. pretty interesting because a lot of that movie is based on paintings. It's literally resetting up famous paintings. Mm. Um, and it's all shot in natural light because he was actually going for quote-unquote historical accuracy. It's fiction, of course, so there's things to discuss in terms of accuracy in historical fiction. But all in all, it's an interesting take. I've been thinking about doing an episode on that, but then again, I'm thinking about doing an episode on pretty much everything. So. <laughs> well, Zero Dark Thirty is my big one that I want you to do. I've been trying to get you to do Zero Dark Thirty for a while. <laughs> Um, a lot of my students will come up to me and say, have you seen Zero Dark Thirty? I know you did American Sniper. That's another. That's actually the, my favorite one that you've done, American Sniper. That was the one I was going to kind of start a discussion with. Is because I know this is politically charged, and a lot of people uh, have strong opinions about the film on the left and the right that you mentioned. Oh, yeah. You mentioned at the beginning there. But I think this is extremely important because you did take an objective look at this thing, and you just straight up said, okay, well, here are the facts, and here is how the film portrayed things. But the thing that I particularly liked how you began this video was you pointed it out right off the bat. These are based off of his own descriptions. These are memoirs. This is what he wrote about his life. And so to begin with, there is a fault in that. Whenever we rely on somebody telling the story of their own life, you know, an autobiography, there has to be a red flag, right? <laughs> yeah, so... A similar instance that I'm currently working on is the Benghazi move, 13 hours. Actually, I've already got the script and everything. In more recent episodes, I've been going into the actual scholarship of these things, especially like the one that I'm going out of the gate with, with this new channel update, is uh, The Revenant. And The Revenant literally only uses one book as its source material, and very loosely at that, even though there is just reams and reams and reams of text to go over this. Something that I think is not discussed enough in the media is sourcing, is citation. Because part of what might make a lot of this stuff inaccurate is not the movie makers themselves, but the source material. Because, mm -hmm. yeah, people like to embellish their own stories. This 13 Hours one is based primarily the book that was by the same name and by the four surviving, well, in Afghanistan we called them mercs. And I'm going to use that term, but that can be offensive to some of them them, but I don't care. The fact is, the mercs who were defending it had a very political motive in their book, and there's a lot of that that comes out in the movie. In fact, the movie actually tries to stay away from Hillary Clinton and all that kind of stuff, but it still incorporates a lot of that into the narrative, which, you know, is 
the key thing that I use for criticizing this stuff is if it disturbs the true narrative, then that is worth pointing out as incorrect. I'm not one for carrying on about how sword fights aren't realistic or the explosion was not the right way that an explosion works or whatever. I'm more concerned about the actual history of it, the narrative itself. Right. Let's get Robert in on this discussion. Robert, is any movie you've seen or heard about recently that just made you think, like, why are they even making a movie about that? Well, I question everything that comes out of Hollywood or the new alt-Hollywood, this, uh, like the Dinesh D'Souza film and stuff like that. There's a lot of stuff with the political front to it. Just pile it on to everything else going on. Well, and of course, Hollywood has a reputation for being left-leaning on a lot of things. I'd actually argue that 13 Hours is heavily right leaning. Yeah, um, that, that would make based on yeah, what so I saw. What is it? Quick so this search. is a real Hollywood director behind this. It's Michael Bay. Well, that might as well be Froghorn Leghorn. So I don't pay yeah. attention. Yeah, he doesn't to even it. know who Michael Bay is. <laughs> <laughs> I, He's famous for making the uh, Transformers movie, Bad Boys. I did a review it. on Pain and Game. I have not watched a movie since the first Hunger Games movie in the theater. A lot of these I don't see in the theater, but I watch a lot of stuff at home. I haven't watched um, a movie in my house for wh- probably 10 years. Why is years. that, Rock? Is it because... They're awful. They're boring. It's like a waste of time. I get nothing out <laughs> of it. I kind of agree on some of these, especially like pain and gain or some of these when you know the actual story behind it you're just kind of going like you could have done so much more by telling the truth and making a good story rather than having to try to tell your own story that's kind of the central conceit of a lot of my whole series on this stuff is that these directors these writers the filmmakers are instead of trying to to tell a based on a true story story they're trying to tell their own conception of the story well outside the bounds of reasonable embellishment they are using real people as abstract objects for their own musings and that not only is slander but it's also a hindrance to just a general conception of reality I mean, you talk about your students coming up to you and asking you about Zero Dark Thirty or these other movies like that. I get comments on my videos all the time of teachers saying, like, and there's still people who think that Spartans kicked people into bottomless pits. And that's just like a standard byproduct of this general inaccuracy. The problem with that is there's a bunch of things that come with that misconception. As soon as you start fracturing off of reality, you start conceiving of things related to that inaccurately as well. And since all history is connected, you're necessarily not understanding reality itself. Yeah. I bring up American Sniper a lot because whenever I have a student that comes up to me and says, what do you think about American Sniper? And I try not to be biased. And I first thing I tell them is I have never seen the film and I don't want to see the film and ask me why. And I say, well, it's based on a lot of lies. It's not a historical film for starters. And I'm just not interested in seeing that. Just like I'm not interested in seeing a lot of superhero movies. And that's just not my thing. If I want to see a movie that portrays itself as a historical movie, then I want to see something that at least tries to get it right, even though most of the time they do fail, but at least they try. And it really bothered me when I first read articles that came out describing all the things that he said happened that didn't happen in his, I guess, autobiography? Is that what we call it? Or memoirs? I don't know. Uh, it's an autobiography when it's detailing a entire story progression rather than a memoir is like individual stories. Okay, good. I'm glad I asked. Yeah. So, you know, the film has, like, as you pointed out, it has its own issues, too. Like, perfect example is the opening scene where he kills the kid and he feels bad about it in the film, whereas in the book, he's, like, bragging about it almost. Yeah, and he certainly wasn't sad about it in real life. The thing is, that's where the book is very useful in terms of scholarship, is that you get his actual opinions about what happened. That's what diaries are particularly good for, is getting people's opinions. Maybe not so much for getting the facts of this happened here and this happened because of this, but in terms of understanding motivations and emotions and opinions and all that kind of stuff, diaries or autobiographies, whatever, are 
aren't particularly good for that. And that's exactly what the book said, and yet the movie decided to go off of that track. Right. And which... so it, it's, it makes it more confusing to everybody. I mean... Mm-hmm people think that is representative of the man it's depicting, and it's not. It doesn't really matter about your political opinion of whether or not you think that Iraq was a good war or not. It does affect your consideration of, I'm forgetting his name. Chris, Chris, Chris Kyle. Kyle. Yeah, I go. forgot. I never said his name. <laughs> the movie was coming off the heels of his rather tragic death by the hands of a person who was suffering severely from PTSD, out of action, just at a shooting range. Then I think it was only like eight months later the movie came out or something like that. It's an insanely short period of time between that. So they were banking on that sorrow, on that grief and that kind of emotional attachment. Yeah, I never really thought much about that, how twisted that is. That's what's happening with 13 Hours. They're banking on the election there and realize... You know, four people died, let alone the, who knows, something between an estimated 30 to 150 enemy combatants killed. Mm -hmm. We don't know anything about collateral damage, at least uh, according to the Senate hearings. I haven't gone anywhere beyond the Senate hearings on that one because I wasn't particularly concerned about seeing those kinds of statistics. Plus, that's like 4,000 pages of text that I had to go through. Anyways... So lots of people died, and yet it's okay to come out with a movie only four years after the fact, politicizing the subject. Yeah, and I think the same thing could be said about Zero Dark Thirty. It felt too propagandish. I know that's not a word, but I like saying it. It felt like it was, and I have not seen that either. I felt like, does this story really need to be told right now when it seems like we don't really know all the, uh, about the truth of what really happened, about how everything went down? It just feels wrong. And that's actually part of why I've been kind of hesitant to look at that one because I haven't actually looked up any of the stuff on it um, too busy with other things the interesting thing with all that is they're willing to put out a movie in something in the very title it's called Dark 30 as in something secretive and a lot of that is still very secret. So why are they able to get away with making a movie like that when I can't even research it to fact check it because it's all secret? Yeah. That just seems really messed up to me. And as somebody who teaches history, when you know that the majority of your students have seen this and they think it's exactly what really happened, it's disheartening to me. Robert, what do you think about all this? I just want to know if, like, that, the Benghazi movie, Chris Kyle, is this just Hollywood deciding, hey, all these movies, because we know establishment Hollywood seen as radical left-wing nutcases, because you see it with all the religious movies, too. And I mean, is this just them saying, hey, you know, there's half the country here that we've been ignoring, so let's just go make a lot of money off of them or why? Is this just a result of their, like... Hey, there's a fortune to be made. Pandering? Is that what it is? <laughs> yeah. So while we do often see Hollywood leaning further to the left than to the right, a lot of movies that we've been discussing here are pretty right-leaning, and it seems actually that Hollywood tends to follow a more rightist approach to history. They want celebratory stories, and I did a video on revisionism, orthodoxy, and all that kind of stuff. Don't need to go into that here, but there is a significant divide in the historical profession between right and left, and the way that you see history, which is the divide between revisionists and orthodoxy. And yeah, Hollywood tends to move towards the orthodox approach, which is interesting because the typical portrayal, as you were just pointing out, is that Hollywood is left-leaning. Yeah, it's a good point. I always think about Forrest Gump, how a lot of people criticize that for being too uh, right-leaning. And that brings up your point that while there are some dark moments of that movie, ultimately it's an American triumph um, example of like how anybody can achieve the American dream, even some like Forrest Gump. But yeah, there's a lot of history in that movie, and it's fun, and obviously they take artistic liberty in there as well, but... Well, that's the interesting thing that you can do with historic fiction. What you can do with historic fiction that I particularly like is that ability to kind of make an odyssey through history and bring up a whole bunch of differing subjects without having to go into the minutia of how they're completely unrelated. Suddenly they're now related because this one guy named Forrest Gump just happened to be there. <laughs> Well, yeah, let's, let's talk about historical fiction. Why not? Robert, you've 
actually created historical fiction. No, he just kind of did it as a form. You're telling a story with history as a backdrop. There's just countless possibilities there, and that's kind of the problem is we've got all of these, you know, we want to do one in 1959 based or, or 57 based around rock and roll and stuff, and you wind up getting lost in the era and the story, and it's very enjoyable. They don't necessarily have to have this political agenda behind them. Cause that's what I was wanting to bring. Like, how much time has to pass before it's considered historical fiction? Like these, you know, Benghazi and hunting down Osama bin Laden. I don't even see that as history yet. Right. Because to me, it's all about, I know this era and what's going on. I want to be transported back in time to something else like the Cuban Missile Crisis. I mean, that's why I love that story so much, because we had to go do all of the, you know, what was going on in October 1962. And we're wanting to take the reader and transport them back in time to that you know i want to escape not get dragged through the political arguments and carnage of today because that's what i experience on the news i mean how often do you hear benghazi 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 it's never last thing i want to do is go watch a movie about benghazi the only problem with doing historic fiction on on something like the cuban missile crisis or whatever is that you are putting it in the backdrop of actual history and by doing so you can't be inaccurate about that backdrop so if your story somehow begins to conflict with the actual story then you're engaging in based on a true story stuff which is no longer historic fiction Mm, that's a good point if you were just to like put a number on it like how far back do you have to go for it to be considered history i would say far back enough where we have at least unclassified documents like to look at like where then Benghazi counts. I don't put a limit on that kind of stuff. Obviously, I do plenty of episodes on very recent history. History is merely about like the, the past. Like the beginning of this podcast. Say, you remember the beginning of this podcast? That was historical. That's right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you're talking about, you know, big capital H stamp history, you know, let's make a documentary about this kind of stuff. Well, that's just about whether or not it's important to people. But whether or not it's something that you can study, well, yeah, that's everything. Anything that has writing about it can be studied. History is just the story of the past. Or video, for Um, that matter. Any kind of documentation. I mean, recent history. For video to happen, you have to have actual writing. (laughs) You know, it's all about the written word. You know, that's why prior to writing, we call it prehistory. Prehistoric times. Because it's before history. But the point is, that means that there is no time limit on what is historic. It is literally anything that's ever been written about. Like, what about, I think it's safe if we can be objective about it? If it's easy to be objective about it, would that be evidence that it's okay to make a historical film about it? So that's what I was getting at with the uh, article. I I found it. Um, It's actually part of an edited edition um, called um, Screening the Past, um, edited by uh, Tony Barta. And the article is called Rescreening the Past, Subversion Narratives, and the Politics of History by Daniel Walkowitz. But it talks about the Nixon movie by Oliver Stone. Now, um, anybody who's seen my historic fiction episode knows I have a bit of a visceral hate for the man. Um, <laughs> probably more than, um, than Michael Bay, actually. But this scholar is arguing against that kind of fact-checking, is arguing basically against the kind of episodes that I make about based on true story movies. Because people have really just destroyed Oliver Stone's movie, but in terms of fact-checking, it's just horrible. But it's talking about how history, especially what is often called new history or revisionism. It's often trying to state, especially with key figures like the most recent presidents of the AHA, say that history is more subjective than that. You don't really get a... uh, pure objective truth as as what the orthodoxy used to say. I have some problems with that myself, but trying to apply that to things that are verifiably false seems 
to be going well out of your way to pardon something that conforms to your own political opinions. And that's what I'm saying that article does. But I am pointing that out as a counter argument to what we're saying here is that many historians believe in subjectivity, that there is no such thing as objective truth. And so things like Zero Dark Thirty that have basically no foundation in terms of research are perfectly okay because, well, history itself is subjective and blah de blah de blah <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to give that any more credence than I already have in stating this. So I know you're playing devil's advocate here, but my argument against that is influence. The way that that can influence the power of a Hollywood film that makes hundreds of millions of dollars that is on Netflix and Hulu, on TVs across the planet, driving the narrative. That kind of subjectivity is different than, say, subjectivity of, like, my interpretation of something and telling my friends about it, you know? Something that always bugs me when AHA presidents are, you know, people like Eric Foner and that, going out of their way to talk about how, oh, everything's subjective and blah, blah, blah. They're talking about, in philosophy, it's called absolute subjectivity and substantive subjectivity. Objectivity. There is a difference between everything is subjective, you can't know anything, and you can't get close, and the idea of getting as close as possible to the truth, which is what most historians who believe in subjectivity believe in. There is no argument to be made about, like, oh, well, we don't know for sure if, uh, I don't know, George Washington was the first president because, oh, everything's subjective. No historian's <laughs> making that argument. But historians are making the argument that like, well, you could consider these various leaders prior to George Washington as pseudo presidents like um, Alexander Hamilton, who was the leader of the uh, Second Continental Congress. You could say that he was the first American president prior to the uh, Constitution. There's and, another guy, too. Oh, there's several, because we also have years of the articles all the way until 1787. But when the U.S. was a confederacy, we didn't exactly have presidents, and it's all about what is your classification and what counts. There, they're saying that that's subjective. It's about whether or not our interpretation defines George Washington as the first president. But nobody's arguing the fact that in 1787, George Washington was the president. Yeah. It's just, that is... Or I'm probably getting the date wrong. 1788? I, uh, uh, I don't know. 1789 is when he became yeah. president. Yeah. I also want to point out another video that you made about the film Spotlight. This movie, I actually gave it a pass. If you look at the yes. thumbnail, uh, I always use that the does not equal sign, you know, with the cross on it for it. But if you look at the thumbnail for that movie, you see an equal sign. Ah. No, that's why I brought up this video, because you actually said, you know what? There's not much to really critique here. I guess that's why I liked it so much, is because the truth is not overrated. It matters, because it was also entertaining as well. And so if you can be entertaining and objective and tell the truth, bravo. I have not, I have not run into a historical movie that I felt deserved that equal sign that was also not entertaining. Not a single one, thus far at least. Always the possibility of finding something. Plenty of documentaries are boring as heck. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Basically, anything from Ken Burns is boring. And that's um, why I did my, started my channel to begin with. Is like, you know what? These kids don't like this crap because it is boring and it's not made for 21st century attention spans. The reason why we all love history is because the best stories really happened. They freaking really happened. Like, anytime I talk to somebody about, like, uh, do you prefer fiction or nonfiction, I'll tell them I prefer nonfiction because I, I like to know what really happened. And they kind of look at me like, I have a lot of friends that dig fantasy and the science fiction and all this. And, and don't get me wrong. I'm a like, science fiction reader. Yeah, no, I, I like definitely. some of it too. But, but the human imagination is, is amazing. But at the same time, human imagination is inspired by true events. Everything's inspired by true events unless you're just, like, on some bad mushroom trip or something like that. I figured, yeah. But Cypher, you prefer science fiction? So, <laughs> because I'm reading so much for uh, my studies, like, I read science fiction for fun because I, I read so much nonfiction that it's basically a job for me. So I can't read that stuff for fun. <laughs> oh, yeah, I hear you. Yeah. 
Plus, I'm always trying to find uh, the good in fiction that is applicable. Science fiction is about big ideas. Even though it's in a fictional setting, in the future, in the past, whatever, it's fantastic always about something grounded in reality. Yeah, that's a good point. I think that's what we try to teach our students that are just the big ideas. At least me, I'm not, I guess I can't speak for Robert. As, I mean, I'm sure it's a, he agrees with me, though, because you only have so much time to teach all the content that we require to. Um, that's why so many teachers are kind of drawn more towards the thematic teaching. That's why I teach thematically, and I say it's not even the most important thing to be chronological here. Let's just jump around and get the big ideas, and because those are what we can translate to us surviving as a society better than you memorizing specific details about a person's life. You know, like no one person is significant enough to say, "Hey, you need to memorize everything about this person. You need to memorize." It. I love learning about Andrew Jackson. I don't fascinating guy. So let's let's learn all these things, and I'm going to quiz you about those things. That's just ridiculous to me. Do you tend to agree with that, Robert? Yeah, it's about the only way to make sense of it is to do it by themes like that. I mean, I don't 100% cater to it, but I have those 10 themes that I'm constantly stressing and pointing out. Teaching by theme is increasingly becoming a fixture of curriculum work. For instance, you guys have probably seen Eric Foner's work. Foner is often the go-to curriculum expert for just American history studies. He kind of represents a very particular mode of thought in that kind of curriculum studies. You guys might remember the big to-do that was in 1992 to 96, somewhere around in there, of the, the American history standards. It was a big freaking deal. <laughs> I, yeah, the standards talking... was kind of where revisionism revealed itself for huge opposition from the right. This is when Newt Gingrich really made his stand and became famous in, what's it called, the Republican Revolution, I think it's called, was spurred on by the vitriol that this was inspired by. That's right, because um, he was a teacher. Well, he was a professor. Um, yeah. I mean, he was a professor for a very short period of time. He's emeritus, so I guess he technically is still one, but whatever. The point being, the problem was people were arguing over whether or not this should be like rope memorization or learning by themes, critical analysis, who it should emphasize, basically everything that we were just talking about, but you guys were very clearly indicating that you're more towards the left on that. I don't understand why it's a left-right thing. <laughs> You, Robert? Why would that be a left-right thing? Well, because of all the left-wing stuff they force into it constantly. I mean, I've been teaching long enough. I've seen the standards revived over and over and over again. The last go-round, I mean, they took out John Hancock and put in Phyllis Wheatley. I'd never heard of Phyllis Wheatley, but I knew exactly who she was before I even went and found it. And I was like, sure, yep. That's exactly what I expected. Common Core gets a lot of criticism because it's very standardized in terms of they're trying to push more conformity to it across the entire country at the federal level, but also because it's a little bit more open-ended and a lot of parents and school boards are like, oh, what exactly are you teaching? And I think a lot of that falls into the standard saying, if nobody's happy, then you've made a good agreement. The best agreement is the one that no one is satisfied by yeah because that's kind of the case here is that they are trying to ride on an even keel but being bombarded from left and right it's kind of hard to do so but it's more skills based is what i like about it it does give more opportunities for open-ended activities and more flexibility as a teacher as far as content like my teaching thematically it fits better with common core than it does with previous standards when students ask me why don't we learn about this or this i'm always like well i have to teach these certain standards and it blows their minds every time I tell them that and I think that's a root cause of a lot of the reason why several students don't like history class you know everybody technically likes history we've talked about this before but they don't make the connection that hey history can be about anything that you are passionate about but here's just what I have to teach you your passion also shows as a teacher too because last year I taught world history and I wasn't as passionate about it next year I'm teaching American history and I'm definitely going to be much more passionate about it still I'm, there's going to be those kids i just cannot reach to connect this to the original subject of this entire podcast <laughs> reason why hollywood is so obsessed with based on true story movies and by the way you stated earlier that it seems that 
they're making more and more and more of these. I'd actually kind of argue that they're making less, oh. but not substantively less. They're definitely making less than they were making in uh, 1955 to 1965. That decade was prolific and amazing, but that's some scholars call old Hollywood. New Hollywood is more based on ticket sales and diminishing returns, hence the sequel craze that we have now. But the reason why based on a true story movies are so popular even to this day with the sequel craze and everything is that it's about storytelling and that's essentially what all of this is it's stories and when you're talking about not being able to engage your students in that not being able to get kids to follow along a lot of them feel like it's rope memorization they don't want to memorize all the names and dates but i tell people all the time when they're talking about memory issues and that it's the story of us it's your story too we're not trying to get you to learn the greats or trying to tell people to learn your history, damn it. It's trying to get you to understand your place in reality. That's what Hollywood is trying to do as well. Trying to make it relevant. I mean, it's... Trying to tell stories. Robert, what do you tell your students who are like, I can't get into this history, like, I, I hate history. What do you tell them? <laughs> I think I gave up trying a long time ago. That's depressing. That is so depressing. <laughs> no, but uh, we, we show movies in class. Actually, I want to bring this up now because we had that lost episode where we recorded the whole episode and we talked about movies that we watched in class that we thought were worthy. That was the episode that the audio was messed up and we <laughs> so it was known as the lost episode. But why do you choose certain movies to show your students and you leave out others? Maybe we can mention some of those movies that we do show and maybe you can chime in too as well, Cypher, about if you've seen them or if, what you think about that. Really, I don't even show them in high school U.S. history anymore because there's not enough time because of the ridiculous end of instruction test. But eighth grade U.S. history, I show The Crossing and some years years if it's a class they can handle it i show the alamo the one with billy bob thornton in it that's about it kids always seem to like it or at least the ones that will express an opinion because when he brought up that question earlier there's a certain type of student almost always female but are so hateful and spiteful about even having to be in your room and it's like <laughs> i have to take this it's stupid because those people are dead and, I don't see and they will not pay attention for even five seconds i mean this is the kind of kid after i get done with the civil war doesn't even know who won we have a word for that there is no reaching people like that it's not about trying to reach people like that they deserve to fail yeah we what i was talking about were the ones who can be engaged with who aren't just trying to pass off class altogether because they just don't want to be in class in general but like genuinely dislike history because they have a particular conception of it but people like that you're talking about the word is ignorant <laughs> There is no better word for it. They are ignoring you purposely. Oh, yeah. They won't get into any of the projects if it's group, class project. They can pick their own topics and sit here and do research. And the weird thing is, yeah, I mean, that's... sometimes it's kids, because I have to teach them every year, you know, from 6th through 12th grade. I mean, they will have liked geography. You know, they will have kind of enjoyed some of the civics type stuff, but when it, it doesn't matter if it's U.S. history, world history, and you can throw government in here as well. Because I get the same, when well, you have to do that, I'm like, inform citizens voting, understanding your country <laughs> and its politics and what's at stake in a lot. No, I mean, because they, they see it as a history class, so. Or the behavior issues, or, you know, they got other issues going on at home or something like that. Uh, I don't know. That's true. I think regardless, they're going to these movie theaters watching these movies that are based on true stories, and for the most part, they're enjoying them. And so to me, that's one of the positives that you can take away about not just Hollywood films about historical events, but historical fiction is you can help kind of grab people in that would normally not be excited about history and sometimes... Or pretend not to be. Or, or exactly, pretend not to be, yeah. And in my classroom, I'll bust out my guitar, I'll sometimes put a wig on or just do something <laughs> ridiculous, like just to get attention 
the students, some of them appreciate that. Some of them are horrified. But the whole point is I'm just trying to do different things to get increased engagement because I understand people care about what means something to them. Because I have parents come up to me at parent-teacher conferences and they say, hey, I did not like history growing up, but now I love it. And you hear that all the time. That as people get older, they get into history. And the reason why a lot of times is they... Kind of like what Cypher was saying, the ignorance thing. I think they they just didn't realize what history was. They kind of had the narrow scope, you know. Well, I, I definitely fell into that. I grew up with a historian for a father, and so history was something that was discussed around the dinner table. It was a chore. I started off college in architecture specifically to avoid it. <laughs> ah. um, I kind of fell into the profession because that's something I was good at and kind of learned my love for it along the way. And part of it was just my friends complaining to me about me lecturing them all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, mind you, I always have been around history because of that, but that means that I should have been more alienated from it than most people. And yet I in turn turned around and became a historian. Yeah. Um, you had to rebel first, as we all do. I mean, you have to find your <laughs> find your own identity before you can... Robert, didn't you tell me one time you got into history when you learned about the Civil War? Is that right? Like, Or your brother got you into it? How old were you? Do you remember how old you were? 17. It was the Civil War Journal. My brother got into because, ironically, it has more to do with his college professor, which is a person I've never met in my entire life. He went to OSU Oak Mulgee, and his college professor was a Civil War reenactor and really got into the Civil War. And my brother got interested in it. And then he was, oh, man, there's a cool show you already come over and watch. And, of course, he lived in Clinton. I lived in Butler. But, you know, I would actually go over to his apartment, and we'd watch Civil War Journal together, which I Ironically, was after I'd had U.S. history in high school and couldn't have told you a thing about it. I, yes, that's what I was going to ask next. He didn't teach the class at all. I mean, he sat up there and read a newspaper. He'd write some notes Ooh. on the board and would sit there and read a newspaper. And I didn't learn a thing. <laughs> I remember thinking, golly, this is stupid and dumb and boring. And and it's that love for storytelling that really drove my change on that. And I think that's kind of what drives a lot of people on this, is that you learn initially from your school it's supposed to be about names and dates and names and dates and dates and names rope memorization about uh, this timeline of important facts but as you grow up you learn more and more and more about history inevitably even if you're trying your best to ignore it you will inevitably learn more and that's why people as they grow up get more and more into it is that they're exposed to a deeper story than just x y and z happened it's that storytelling element yeah which is why films do work and why i i don't show very many films in my classroom but when i do i either show a clip that tells a story or i show the whole movie because that's what tells the full story in x and men were there, were there any other movies robert that you wanted to share that you showed in any of your other classes before i list some of my movies that i like to show i remember you mentioning time. the cuban missile crisis I show that in government of class it. like 12 days after talking about the presidency because i think it does a very good job of showing the presidency and all the stuff that goes on behind the scenes and how stressful the job is and such. Even when movies are inaccurate, and I can't speak to that movie's accuracy, but even when they are inaccurate, I keep on having to put in these little blurbs now at the end of my episodes going like, but they do get some things right in terms of just kind of understanding how things worked. All of these movies have an ability to do the how, but just not the why. Yeah, I was a fan of that show, The West Wing, which kind of showed a more contemporary view of what went on behind the scenes with the presidency. But the problem with a show like that, it was clearly left-leaning. Obviously, it's fiction, but wasn't The West Wing about a Democratic president? Yes. <laughs> so, so, duh, it's going to be left-leaning. By default, it, yeah, it has. It kind of has to but be. Was, well, then again, look at uh, House of Cards, for instance. Oh. He's a Democrat. 
Like the main character is a Democrat. That show is not really I mean, left it, or right leaning, though. It's more just, it, yeah. if anything, libertarian. It's anti-government. Anti- <laughs> yeah, it's very anti uh, anti politics. But he also is a Southern Democrat, so I think they're trying to play something on that. You know, the whole Dixiecrat thing. Um, I think it's a, almost like a, it has glimpses of Bill Clinton and Hillary Clinton. So much of it is just kind of like trashing the whole system. It, you can almost argue that it's partially responsible for some of the discussion by uh, many Americans today. They see how um, politicians are portrayed in House of Cards. It's just so negative overall. It makes you really cynical about everyone. the politicians themselves do a good enough job of that. Yeah, well, but like Mr. Smith goes to cynical, Washington. Uh, Mr. Smith goes to Washington for the longest time. A lot of people looked at that movie like, oh, you know, good people can go in there and they can yeah, maybe no, make Hollywood. a real difference. Yeah, yeah, and Mr. Smith goes to Washington's key plot is about how one man can filibuster the Senate and then freaking... <laughs> The biggest filibuster that happened in recent memory from that movie was the 24-hour filibuster of the Civil Rights Act of 1958. So, my, the movie itself, yeah, okay, it's it's yeah. nice and wonderful, but when you look at the reality, it's a very different thing. Mm-hmm. House of Cards is sardonic and, yeah, cynical, and I call myself the cynical historian, but I think we need that. I think we need to be able to see through the rhetoric and the lies question their motivations constantly because as a politician their entire job is to make us get on their side and to accumulate power i mean that's what the definition of politics is it's it's about power it's not i mean there has to be a certain element of narcissism to begin with for anyone to even consider running for a high public office i mean I had people ask me before, like, would you ever run for public office? And I I said, not really. I don't think I'd ever want to do that. It's one of those things. I also think history teachers and historians make for horrible people in office. Prime example would be Woodrow Wilson. Newt uh, Gingrich? <laughs> yeah, Newt Gingrich is another prime example. Oh, you hate Woodrow Wilson, don't you? <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> I'm not a big fan of him either. He is a raving racist, an incredibly inept historian, and even more inept as a politician. And furthermore, just didn't give a damn about the people he was supposed to be governing. Um, well, I know he didn't really care about minorities or immigrants or women. Like, especially, uh, he couldn't care less about the women protesters in front of the White House that kept oh, yeah. calling <laughs> calling for uh, women's suffrage, but he just, whatever, you know. He was also big into promoting frickin' Birth of a Nation. Oh. And uh, the sub subsequent KKK that it, that was founded on that movie. Let's not quibble about it. Wilson was a raving racist. Let's talk about Birth of the Nation though because this whole theme of this episode is film and how history is shown. That's a perfect example of how film can drive the narrative for the national dialogue because you saw the resurgence of the KKK in large part because of that film. Mm-hmm. That film was uh, created to uh, kind of glorify the old KKK during Reconstruction that was standing up for for Southern traditions or whatever, especially Protestant traditions. And then next thing you know, you are these revivals. And in the 1920s, the KKK was bigger than it ever been. It had become like this organization so big that even the Democratic Party was influenced by them. They had, they had not just the Democrats. Oh, yeah, Republicans too, yeah. But they, uh, the entirety of American politics was heavily influenced by it. The Klan was huge. It was everywhere. And it was all-encompassing in the 20s. And it was because of this move. And in no small part because of Woodrow Wilson's endorsement of it. Right. Funny thing about film history in that is this is kind of one of the biggest blockbusters of Hollywood history. So this was absolutely massive and it also ensconced a lot of cinematography. It's really important in terms of film history, just in terms of cinematography. But when historians start to talk about how different film movements came to be, they always have to kind of wince as they say, yeah, well, Birth of a Nation started that. Because the cover is a Klansman with a burning cross in his hand. Oh, yeah. It's pretty blatant there. <laughs> Although, interestingly enough, D.W. Griffith himself wasn't actually that racist. This was actually a problem with the history profession at that point in time, was that there was this whole thing called the lost cause was really taking hold, especially with people like Woodrow Wilson, who was a history professor. I'm trying to remember, is it? Princeton. Princeton. Uh, Princeton, yeah. Princeton, yeah. He was the head of the freaking history department. Hey, come on. And he was a New South historian. He was 
very much into the lost cause and all that. This was something that was permeating academia and starting to influence everything else. So D.W. Griffith was just kind of going with the scholarship at the time. Mm. His next movie, coming out only two years later, was a movie called Tolerance. Oh, you mean Intolerance, right? It's Intolerance, yeah. yeah. And that's not facetious in the slightest. It's talking about racial tolerance, talking about needing to support other people's values, even if you disagree with them and stuff like that. People being intolerant and what's wrong with that? By D.W. Griffith, the person who made Birth of a Nation. Well, this is why I think as history teachers, it's extremely important to choose the right films to show your students because you know they're a captive audience and it's really hard. Like, I've shown movies but, in the past. But I, Griffith didn't think that his film was right. ideology and that's right. what made it really powerful. What makes Based on a True Story so easily harmful is that people honestly believed that the KKK had saved the South from recently freed slaves who were devaluing the South during Reconstruction. That the KKK stopped Reconstruction and the evils of Northerners trying to force their values on the South. This movie ensconced that in the public perception, even though Griffith thought that he was just kind of going with the current scholarship on the subject. Scholarship doesn't change things very quickly, as we were talking about with the American standards. It doesn't change things very quickly. It doesn't change our perception very quickly. But Hollywood has the power to do it very quickly. Yeah, that's why I'm extra critical about films that come out that say based on a true story. And I see right now, ever since 9-11, I've seen just ultra patriotism type movies. Even superhero movies have this. Uh, it's all about a few elite people who can save us and we are the good guys. They are the bad guys. There's clearly good and evil. There is no gray area in between. Although you're seeing a change of that. I haven't watched many superhero movies lately, but I'm hearing there's a lot of change with that whole good versus evil thing. There's a lot of more complexities, which I'm really appreciating. I love moral ambiguity in my stories. Yes, me too. Me too. Actually, my favorite movie, period, is The Watchmen. My favorite comic as well. Most Hollywood films often have a hint of glory. Think of the movie Glory itself. The movie Glory about the 54th Mass. This was a movie I actually used to show. But yeah, like an example of how war movies typically, a lot of movies about the Battle of Gettysburg. Gettysburg based on Killer Angels. It's about, but it's about the glory, right? It's about bravery and honor and courage and... You know, sure. battle tactics. The little about just telling the account of the Battle of Gettysburg and what happened there and what the officers were going through and the decisions they made. And well, the officer stuff is all fictional yeah. and a lot of it is actually really false. They make Pickett's Charge into something glorious rather than stupid because <laughs> that was freaking stupid. And they also try to push the decision away from Lee, which is also incorrect. The movie has a lot of problems. What it gets right is the reenactment stuff. But the reenactment stuff, it's not hard to do. You just draw lines on the battlefield and show where you need to move, and everybody just kind of marches at each other. Reenactors do that kind of thing all the time. That doesn't make for a good story. Yeah, and that's just part of the movie. Sometimes I show certain battle scenes, like the Battle of Gettysburg, the film Gettysburg, yeah. Another movie that I show and I used to show in world history every year was The Pianist. It is, of course, fiction, but like I think yes. it does a better job of capturing the Holocaust than Schindler's List. Schindler's List is based on a true story, kind of. It's, it's basically based on a few anecdotes and then expanding from that. Nobody in The Pianist is a real person. Well. Which also means that they get to play around with it quite a bit more. Well, the main character is um, he he really existed. I mean, I mean, it's very loosely based on you know what this guy went through. But yeah, a lot of liberty here, uh, just making stuff up. I didn't know that it's based on anyone. Yeah. Oh yeah. It's not completely historical fiction. Oh, that's different. So that changes See, your whole that's... interpretation, doesn't it? <laughs> yes, it does. <laughs> yeah, the guy who uh, it's Vladislav Stilman. They base it off of his life, and um, he was a actually a pretty popular musician um, in Warsaw. 
and I obviously haven't done the research to talk about it because I didn't even know that it was based on a true story. That changes a lot of things in terms of my interpretation of it. Yeah. So we were talking about moral ambiguity when we brought this up. That movie doesn't have moral ambiguity. The problem with trying to do moral ambiguity in movies is that you have to actually humanize the bad guys. If you're going to have proper moral ambiguity, there are no bad guys. And that means having to make the Nazis not be bad guys. That's pretty difficult. Yeah. But in the movie, there um, is more ambiguity a little bit. It, you've seen it, right? So you know that the, the soldier, the Nazi soldier who helped him, who actually provided him a hiding spot and food and clothing. Yeah, so there is a little bit there, right? Mm-hmm. But he was an SS. That signifies it is not a poster child for moral ambiguity. You want moral ambiguity in terms of World War Two? go to Fury. Fury captures that. You want moral ambiguity in terms of Nazis, go to Downfall. Not exactly Nazis, but you could go to Das Boot, but Das Boot isn't really about Nazis, it's about Germans. Moral ambiguity is also something that needs to be captured more and based on a true story stuff, because you don't get to have good guys and bad guys in reality. So why do movies portraying reality get to do that? Well, the Nazis are always the perfect example whenever you bring up them like, well, here was a time where there really were good guys and bad guys, where... That's the good war. Yeah, that's the good war. The Japanese were clearly evil. The Imperial Japan taking over all these other countries, just doing what they want. The Nazis just taking over all of Europe, doing what they want. There is an argument to be made there, though, that you could say, well, maybe the Pacific War was justified, but how... How did that justify the European war? Maybe that's that's the argument then, is it because they declared war on us then? Yeah, but at the same time, nothing had happened between us yet. There was no Pearl Harbor. We're just German submarines off our shoreline. Us helping out the British, I think. Oh yeah, that. Yeah, but there was no. But there was no Lusitania for World War Two. But there there was the the Reuben James. James. The Reuben James. Uh, I don't know that one. The Germans sank one of our military vessels. Oh, that's right. No, I think that's always the go-to war as the just war. I mean, it's... Oh, it's just... Yeah, Reuben James was sunk in October 31st of 41. Huh. Yeah. Then again, look at the USS Panay in 1938 when the Japanese sank one of our vessels in the Yangtze yeah, the- River. Um, it's kind of like, what was it doing there? Political it was part of the Yangtze River Patrol. Chain. We actually ran away from the Yangtze River Patrol, which we had established in 1854. So, like, if you consider that a war of occupation, then it's by far our longest war. It's nearly 100 years. But it, it's not really a war. It's just patrols up and down the Yangtze River with sporadic fighting flaring up every once in a while. The USS Penney was just part of that. And part of the reason why we've pulled out completely in 1940 was because... Because of the Japanese occupation. We actually fought the Japanese by accident in... <sighs> Big Trade Part starts with an S. I am forgetting the name of it. It's in um, southern China. Ah, whatever. Accidentally fought them. Mostly because they were shooting at us. But that doesn't matter. We shouldn't have been fighting them. Wow. I never knew that. All we of these things. There's, five there's minutes, little so. incidents that lead up. It's the big thing of Pearl Harbor that made it happen. Right, right. That's, yeah. It's easier just to focus on Pearl Harbor always and ignore all the little things, of course. Yeah. We have about five minutes, though, guys. So I would like to wrap things up by looking towards the future of, based on a true story films, what would you like to see in future Hollywood films in terms of how they portray historical events? Or what movies do you think should be made about certain subjects that have not been... Uh, brought up like my example is I think there should be biopic on Harriet Tubman I think that that would make a great story for a film if you look at Harriet Tubman's life I mean I'm surprised it hasn't been done before as far as I know Harriet Tubman is a great subject but doing it as an entire biopic Hollywood fails miserably every time they do a cradle to grave story they do much better isolating the story on a particular event or a particular time frame. So, like, Tubman's involvement in the Civil War would be a excellent uh, movie. There's a bunch of action that could happen. There's a lot of things like her getting assaulted on the train ride back to Washington, D.C. to report some bad things that were happening at the hospital she was working in. There's a lot of things. I, it would be really bad if they tried to incorporate from when she was a slave all the way to um, her dying in what 1913 
first of all, she lived a long time and did a lot of stuff throughout the... Like, imagine them trying to handle her involvement in Harper's Ferry. That just couldn't work. Like, first of all, you'd have to demean her, which we don't exactly want to demean her memory right now. And then you'd have to handle all that within the context of everything else. It's just too much. Gotta narrow it down. For instance... There's some movies that have come close recently, like Unbroken. That was very close to being a good historical movie. Just that it omitted some things that actually left plot holes in the actual story. Which, the fact is, the movie purposefully cut that stuff out to make it shorter. That's the stuff that needs to stay in. The things that are important to the story. That's Mm. what I've been harping on this whole time. Is It's about storytelling. Mm -hmm. And until they can get that right then they probably shouldn't do these movies that fail so miserably all right on that note we probably better wrap it up it's over two hours here 